everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1.6 scale radio controlled vintage ArmorTech early production German Tiger 1. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made to the tank's turret functions as well as many of the turret detailing, all of which we'll be going over in this video. Before we continue with the turret detailing functions, let's go ahead and first wrap up some of the last of the details that needed to have been added to the hull. Starting with the FIFL system, here you can see the FIFL system that's now fully completed. This would include the addition of the tubes, as well as the straps and the funnels. Now, of course, this being a radio control tank and, and periodically need to get access to the battery compartment, all of this setup here is designed to disengage, just like on the real Tiger 1. To take it apart, you simply undo these fasteners here, remove the straps, and then the tubes simply lift and remove off of their elbows. Once the tubes are disconnected, the entire engine hatch can then pivot open. Now, to disconnect, you simply just yank on the tubes here and the elbows here will pivot out of the way. For the air intake, removal of the tube is not necessary as the entire unit can swing for clearance to get access to the engine hatch. However, like I mentioned with the other videos, due to the design of the battery compartment with that of the with the re recharge jack found in this location here, getting access to the batteries it needs to be done to a minimum and is not required for regular everyday maintenance. Moving to the straps that hold the FIFL tubes in place, the straps that you see on the model here are scratch built and are not the kit supplied units. For the kit supplied pieces, the kit supplies you with a simple square length of laser cut steel. Rather than using that, I went ahead and fabricated new ones out of brass. Now, in addition to fabricating the new ones, you can see that the design of these straps are a lot more elaborate compared to what is typically found on most scale models. Most scale models of the Tiger One with the FIFL system, this detail here is that of a strip that has no bottom portion of the detailing. However, on the real Tiger One, the straps that retain the tubes in place were the way you see it on this model here. And that is with two descending square brackets which are welded directly to the strap. If you notice the brackets themselves are not symmetrical. The one that holds the FIFA Y down is a lot longer compared to the one that anchors the air intake in place. This is the exact same type of detailing found on the reverse side. By doing this, the piece is much more accurately detailed compared to just having it with a simple strip located on top. Moving from the FIFL system takes us to another bit of detailing that was added and completed since the previous video, and it's that of the rear two S-mine grenade canisters. The rear versions of the S-mines are mounted in a different way compared to the ones found on the rest of the hull, in which they are mounted to two little plates that are flush mounted directly to the top deck. Because of the the location required to opening up the grill work as well as the clearance of the FIFL system, the S-mine is mounted in a position that you see here. It is elevated off of the hull and is straddled via two brackets. On the left hand side we have here a steel sheet metal bracket which is bolted to a boss that is then welded to the side of the tank. As for the one on the opposite side and it is that of a brace which is welded to the tank as well. The components were mounted and then their sculpted weld beads were added. It is a mirror image on the opposite side. Now it's important to point out that all of the equipment that you see here is supplied with the revised S-Mine sets which have been posted on EastCoastArmory.com. This replaces the older pattern sets which have been in production for a number of years. The sets are now available and contain all the components to mount not only the two in the rear, However, it also gives you the components to mount the other ones on the hull as well. Now is at this point here where I could point out one quirk with the early production Tiger ones, and it's probably a reason why these S mines were replaced 
by the Germans on the, the real tanks themselves. And if we notice here, that has to do with that of the turret. The S mine is to the proper scale and it is in the correct location. And if you notice here, if I try to rotate the turret, it will make contact with the S mine and will break it. This is true for as well as the original S mines, which were supplied with the Armor Tech kit. This is one of those quirks where you just have to be aware if operating this tank as the end user. As if you try to rotate the turret past this location here, you will cause damage to the S mine. More than likely, this was a problem that the Germans did encounter, which is why I wouldn't be surprised in field you would see these components probably removed from this location here. And it's more than likely also a reason why you don't see this exact same setup on the opposite side of the vehicle, as that way the turret can rotate all the way around. With the hull basically out of the way, I am now working on the tank's turret as well as the turret functions. One turret function in particular is something that uh, is a real treat to not work on, but also to show you the viewers. And it's also a function that I've been keeping secret since the start of the project, specifically for this video right here. This device here is something more along the lines of what you would see being discussed by Ian on the Forgotten Weapons channel. What you're looking at here is the original ArmorTech blank firing gun simulator device. The system itself is fairly rare, as it was not in production for a very long period of time. The system dates back to 2002, when ArmorTech was first founded. Shortly after the release of the ArmorTech mid-production Tiger I, they went ahead and designed the following unit. Unlike most common radio control tanks on the market in both 116 scale as well as many in 16 scale in which the gun firing animation is done electrically and mechanically where you have a photo strobe to simulate the gun flash and a some kind of a gearbox to replicate that of the recoil which is then patched into the sound system like what's typically of course done on the Tamiya full option kits as well as even the Tegan tanks which are being produced today. Back when ArmorTech was first making tanks, this was not the design that was to be used. In fact, what made the ArmorTech kits unique was that they had an option for the following system. This system, rather than using a electrical mechanical device to simulate the animation, they actually use a real pyrotechnic charge. What's very interesting about the ArmorTech system is that for the pyrotechnic charge, it actually utilizes a 12 gauge blank system. And not only does it fire 12 gauge blanks, but it is done in a repeating manner with that of a very large revolver that I have here. All of the components for the gun system are strewn on the table that you see here. This is all left stock from ArmorTech and I did not do any mods or any sort of pre prep work to these pieces prior to the shooting of the scene. Getting into the parts are as follows. This large, substantial bit of aluminum that we have here is that of the receiver. All of these components that are this gray color are made from CNC aluminum. Now, all of the components will be fitted to all of the pre-drilled and tapped holes that we have on this unit here. If we notice the receiver, the cylinder, as well as th this portion of the mechanism are all made out of aluminum and have a gray dull finish. The finish appears to be that of anodizing, but however, I may be mistaken. The receiver block has some bushings already pre-installed and all of the threadings, like I mentioned before, pre-drilled and tapped from ArmorTech. Moving from the receiver takes us to the cylinder. Anyone who knows firearms or who has worked on a revolver before, this should look very similar. This side here of the face of the cylinder is where you actually put in the 12 gauge blanks. Now if we notice on the reverse side it is solid and there are no holes for that that match up in sync with the cylinder. There's a special reason for this which I'll be going over very shortly. We have here the camming surface for that of the locking mechanism which indexes the cylinder to that of the chamber. And if we notice on top of every single slot in the cylinder for the round, we have another hole. Again, all of this I'll be going over very shortly. 
In the center here we have a brass bushing and one is also present on the reverse side. Moving from the cylinder takes us to the mount. This unit here connects the receiver to the actual gun barrel. Now it is made basically just like the current generation units made by Armortech. However, this one does have this gray anodized finish. It does have the honeycomb setup, which is found on the front, which is also found on many of the Armortech kits. Moving from the barrel mount takes us to the motor. The cylinder that setup that you see here is actually electrically driven. And that's facilitated by the stepped motor that has a fuse built in. It's also pre-wired, just like many of the other motors found on the Armor Tech tanks. Moving from the motor takes us to the gear tooth ring. This is very reminiscent to the actual gear tooths, which are used on the to actually rotate the turret, but of course it's a lot smaller. This one might imagine is going to be mounted to the cylinder to which then the motor can actually turn and index the cylinder for firing. Moving from the gear tooth ring takes us to the barrel connector assembly. It's just a CNC steel pipe that's threaded on either end. Of course, this is going to be used to connect the barrel to the barrel mount that we have here. We have here a solid CNC steel lug. This is used for indexing of the cylinder and acts as a spindle so the cylinder can rotate freely inside of the receiver. We have a few more smaller fittings. This of course is that of a bus fuse for the motor. We have here a variety of springs in different sizes. More than likely one of those springs will be used for that of the firing pin which is also posted on this table. We have here a washer with that of a rubber gasket built in. A brass spacer washer. Two steel gears, which more than likely are going to be used to connect the motor to the gear tooth ring for the cylinder. A large CNC'd steel hex bolt, a steel pin, more than likely used for that of the gear, a plastic twisty knob, a few assorted fasteners, a lock plate, a smaller fitting, which more than likely is to be used for this component here, which is very clearly that of the firing pin. And here's the blank unit now fully assembled and is also operational. To get a good idea on what the unit looks like assembled, this here is the back end of the unit. And here goes the front end. Now the unit has a very interesting way the system indexes as well as fires the charge on the blank, of which I'll be going over very soon. Mechanically, the blank firing system is very interesting the way it works. What's, what I find interesting about it is that the single electric motor here does all of the work for that of not only rotating and indexing the cylinder, but also with cocking and firing of the firing pin. The cylinder moves in one direction, which is illustrated by this Milden arrow, which was found on the actual CNC component. If we notice, I went ahead and brush some white paint onto the arrow just to make it highlight from that of just leaving it as is. To get an idea on how the system works, I must first remove the cylinder. This is also how you load the mechanism. The cylinder is held in place with this plastic knob that we have here. The knob gets unscrewed. There is a brass bushing as well. Then the entire cylinder just slides out of the receiver assembly. Now for the actual operation, like, I, like you've seen before, there is an electric motor that is connected to two small gears. The gears make contact with the gear which is found on the back portion here of the cylinder. This of course will rotate and index the cylinder along its center axle. 
Now, for the actual cocking and firing of the firing pin, this is done with a cam lug, which is found right here in the back portion of the receiver. So let me see if I can get into frame. There it is. This little lug here is spring retained by this brass mechanism that we have here on the reverse side. The brass triangular piece here is acts more as a linear hammer and the way the system works is that when the gears are rotating the cylinder it turns in a clockwise motion you'll notice on the edge here of the cylinder there are camming recesses. When it's rotating the cam is actuated by this ramp section here to which then it pushes up on the pin. The pin pushes up against this brass component. If we notice the brass component has three fasteners that act as guides and they also have very strong springs mounted on top of them. During the camming procedure the entire mechanism gets pushed upward and then when the cylinder lines up to this section here there is a drop-off the drop-off then allows the cam to fall back into place which then because of the spring pressure has this brass block fall with some velocity on the on in the center portion here of the brass block we have here another fastener this fastener here acts as the striker which makes contact with the firing pin which is located on the bottom portion here of the mount. With the force of the spring the fastener makes contact with the firing pin. The firing pin then protrudes from the inside portion here of the receiver wall. That firing pin is timed perfectly to be in the center portion here of the cylinder to which is where the primer of the cartridge for the 12 gauge blank is located, thus firing the round. After the primer is ignited, this ignites the charge to which then the combustion of the blank expands. Now unlike a typical firearm or a blank mechanism for that matter in which the bore and the chamber and the barrel all in line with each other on the armor tech system that's not the case if we notice we have these holes which are located 90 degrees on top of the cylinder Th these holes here are where the actual combustion and blast exit out of the chamber they blast upward and enter into this channel that we have here the channel then emerges this way, is blocked off by this fastener, so is funneled 90 degrees again. The blast then connects to the, now this section here connects to the trunnion, which is connected to the barrel, and the blast from this point here emerges from the gun barrel as it would on a standard firearm. As for assembling the setup that you have here, this was done with relative ease as the Armor Tech kit is well designed in that respect. One area that did need to get fiddled with is some of the tolerances on a few of the components. Starting with the main gear found on the cylinder, you'll see that the gear teeth, I had to go ahead and slightly redefine the shapes of them. Even though this piece did have the teeth that were laser cut into the steel, the geometry that was found on this laser cut piece did not fully mesh properly with that of the gears that we have here on the gearbox. The piece does spin with the stock configuration, however, it does put a lot more stress and strain on the motor. In order to go ahead and improve the efficiency with a triangular file, I went ahead and went across every single one of these teeth in order to remove just the amount of material so the piece actually meshes very fluidly on that of the two mating gears. In addition to that, we'll see, you'll notice I went ahead and added lock washers to the fasteners on this section here just for more 
added strength as this is one piece that does not want to get loose on you during operation. It's also important to point out that red Loctite was used on many of the fasteners as well as blue Loctite was also used on a few of the other fasteners of which I'll go over in a second. In addition to taking care of the tolerances on the gear, I also went ahead and polished down the sides of and the rear of the drum as well as the matching surfaces on the receiver housing itself. This was done with a very fine grit piece of sandpaper and after several passes this also loosened up the tolerances to allow the cylinder to spin with a lot less effort. In addition to the emery cloth on those surfaces, the center spindle here also was polished on the lathe. I put the piece on the lathe and again with a very fine grit sandpaper went up and down the spindle which also helped remove and polish the tolerances to the point where the piece will just glide directly over the spindle. Again this is also cutting down on the type of friction that one might encounter. Another location that I went ahead and altered was that on the support gear here, I went ahead and added a spacer washer to the bottom portion of the gear. This separates the gear from making contact with the surface of the receiver housing and also improves the, fluid, the fluidity of the way the pieces rotate. As for the back, the holes that are found on the linear hammer were also slightly enlarged in order to again give less resistance to the component during its operation. This also went ahead and made the piece function with a lot less effort. Another location that was needed to have been tweaked was that for the protrusion of the firing pin. The the receiver housing has two pre-assembled and pre-inserted bushings from Armortech in these two locations here. The bushing is a nice component, however to improve the, again, the efficiency of the piece, I went ahead and slightly enlarged the hole for the firing pin. This allows the firing pin, again, less friction when it needs to harness its spring power to ignite the primers. As for the motor, this is assembled out of box with no mods needed. The fastener that is used to hold the gear to the mechanism is a grub screw. However, the Armortech grub screw was a little on the long side and because of which, if built stock, will make contact with the recesses that we have here. The fastener was shortened in half and then was mounted to the way you see it on the mechanism. Now for the fasteners that hold on the spindle as well as the motor, red Loctite was utilized. For the fasteners that hold on the gear to the motor as well as on the trigger and the firing pin mechanism, the Loctite was that was used was blue Loctite. The reason for that is in case any adjustments or any type of other maintenance needs to be made to these components, the Loctite will give before the red ones will, which can possibly cause issue if having to ever need to remove these fasteners. As for the gears themselves, you'll notice that they have some grease added to them, of course, to add with lubrication. As for the linear hammer mechanism, this was lubricated with that of oil, and the oil really also helps make the piece glide a lot easier. A swipe of oil was also added to the spindle as well as to the receiver housing in itself. Now unfortunately I can't test fire the unit in this video with ammunition as I've been having a difficult time in tracking down the specialty cartridges which are used for this system. The system is more more or less designed for users in the United Kingdom and apparently these type of rounds which are for this system here are more prevalent and more available down there. As for for testing purposes I went ahead and made some snap caps basically they're just spent shotgun shells that I have trimmed to the specs of the cartridges used in this unit. As you can see the cartridges which are used in this system are very special. They're a lot shorter compared to that of a standard 12 gauge. They're kind of similar to the Aguila mini shells however they're still shorter than that. Now this system here is exclusively for blank firing only. It is not designed for use with live ammunition nor is it even possible to put live ammunition inside of this system. The, the cylinder is only designed for shells that are this big and rightfully so. 
As for loading the cylinder, just like with any other revolver, you simply put the rounds where you want them to be. The system then slides. Now keep in mind, this unit here is permanently bolted to the tank's trunnion and gun and stays inside of the turret, which is why it is imperative to have the roof disassembled from the body like the way I showed in a previous scene. With the unit now ready for installation, you simply line it up and insert the unit where it needs to go. Reinstall the brass washer and thread on the knob. Now the knob holds on the component. Now you don't want to thoroughly tighten it all the way to which you could crank down on it as this will actually restrict the motion of the cylinder. So you want to have it on but just loose enough so where it just keeps a piece from from it keeps the, the cylinder in place however it does not restrict it from moving. And the way this is done is that I tighten it till it stops and then I just back out a quarter of a turn. The piece can now ro fully rotate. Now the system is 12 volt powered and to test the system I will utilize this 12 volt battery that I have here. I connected two wires to act as test leads and I will connect them to the plug that is found on the motor to which you'll first see the system in action in this side and then I'll cut to the back portion so you can actually see the system with the firing mechanism and how that performs as well. Of course, you want to match the colors. Now, like I said before, this is one system where the direction of the motor can only go in one way. If you have the system hooked up in reverse, you will actually break the motor due to the camming recess, which is found on the linear hammer mechanism. So it is imperative that when you're doing the electronic portion, you keep everything with the proper polarity. And here we go. And here's the blank system now mounted to the model's gun and elevation equipment. Now these components here will be discussed in more detail in part two of this video as to put them into part one the video would have been too long due to all the discussion which was devoted to that of the blank firing unit. As for the blank system the way it connects to the Armortech mantlet is very simple and is done out of box. No mods were needed to this section over here. However, one mod that I did do was that of the mounting bracket that we have here in the center. The original Armortech piece, like what was shown in the um, in the description portion of the video, has a honeycomb system that is mounted in this portion here. This was drilled out to allow better access for the blast to exit through the front of the barrel. The issue with the honeycomb is that it can trap extra carbon fouling which can spool up in this area here and cause problems when it comes time for actually cleaning up the system. As for the wiring, the wiring of the unit is as follows. We have here the motor. The motor has a simple type plug and this plug runs along the circumference of the turret. Right on this section here which would be next to the escape hatch which is also going to be discussed in part two of this video, we have here a kill switch. The purpose of the kill switch is to deactivate the blank firing system so that there is no chance for it to trigger if in case the radio function is accidentally tripped. Even though this is a blank firing unit, I feel more comfortable having a manual cutoff system just for safety purposes. The switch is labeled with red to know when the system is armed. Moving from the switch takes us to the electronic switcher. The electronic switcher that we have here was supplied with the gun blank system and this system here connects to the radio equipment via the umbilical cord. Moving from the electronical equipment takes us to this black canvas bag that we have here on the interior portion of the turret. Now this is not part of the Armor Tech kit and was something that I designed. 
The reason for this bag here has to do with some of the downsides to the blank firing system. Some of the issues that this system has has to do with the way it is designed to fire. And to put things in perspective here, the best way to illustrate that is with a real firearm. Now this here is my real POA German Luger. Sure, it's empty. Now, even though this system here is a revolver and this system here is a semi-automatic pistol, they both feature the same type of components, namely that of a barrel, a chamber, and a firing mechanism. Now, with the Luger, just like with any other handgun or firearm for that matter, you have the chamber and the barrel and the firing pin all in line with each other as when they go off, you need to have the bullet exit from the end of the barrel. Now, the ArmorTech system does not utilize this inline design. In fact, like I mentioned before, the rounds are actually pointing backwards and the fire has to go up and bend 90 degrees in order to emerge from the gun barrel. The reason for this convoluted pattern design, from what I understand, is that because ArmorTech is a UK-based company, this system here has to comply with the laws of the United Kingdom, which is why, from again, from what I was told, is that in the United Kingdom, you cannot have the barrel, the chamber, and the firing group all in line with each other, as then it could allow the user to have a projectile emerge from the barrel, which is a no-no. Because of that, ArmorTech designed the system with the configuration that you see here. Now, one of the issues that this type of design has is that when it comes to firing a bullet from a standard type of firearm like this, when the blast ignites the, the cartridge, the bullet merges out of the barrel as well as all the gas and particulate and cordite or whatever is left over in the chamber generally emerges from the end of the barrel and is relatively clean in the rear area. Because of the 90 degree bends that the blast has to make, a large amount of fouling stays inside the system and will not emerge from the end of the barrel. After prolonged use, the system will become heavily gunked up with this extra carbon fouling and will need to be cleaned more often than that of a traditional inline system. That is why we have this large fastener that we have here on the top. The purpose of this fastener here is that you unscrew it and it gives you access to clean the chamber as well as the barrel portion in the back end here of the turret. Now even though this does allow you to clean it, a large volume of powder does emerge from this system and from what I've seen from many pictures of people actually have this unit and fire this unit, it does emit a large amount of fouling that does enter inside of the turret and more importantly the hull area. So much so that it will make a literal mess of your entire innards of the model. In order to mitigate this as much as possible, I went ahead and designed the system that we have here. With this system here, we have a dark gray canvas that is bolted to the bottom portion of this turret. The idea is that this keeps all of the gunk and the fouling isolated into the turret as, as opposed to having it distributed all over the lower hull. When it comes time to clean the system, these fasteners here are not locked tight in. You simply unthread them, take this canvas material and throw it in the wash, which will thoroughly clean any sort of carbon fouling that is on the canvas. In addition to that, in order to have the wires emerge out of the system, the canvas is designed with that of a Velcro opening that we have here. The Velcro is for the wires and the umbilical cords to exit. And then when they seal up there, they provide a nice tight seam which prevents or mitigates as much as possible any sort of fouling which could enter inside of the lower hull. Now, the turret did have to receive some mods in order to get this component put in place. The original ArmorTech tank, when it was originally designed, had two holes drilled in these two sections here that were pre-drilled and tapped. The reason for that was for the inst installation of this component here. This very large bracket is that of a turret guide. On the first and second run ArmorTech Tigers, namely the original mid-production and this early production unit, 
a feature of the system that we have here. What this does is that this bolts to the turret and then on the directly below this portion to the lower hull, there is a large threaded steel block. This steel column would bolt to the bottom of the tank and then a plastic knob like this one over here would then secure the component together. The uh, idea of this system here is to keep the turret aligned and fastened to the hull to prevent it from falling out. However, with practice, this is one of the systems where it's a good idea in theory, however, in practice, it's not very practical. Some of the issues that this design has is that first, due to the sheer weight of the turret, having it pop off of the hull is definitely not something that's going to happen. The turret itself, in this configuration here, weighs approximately 60 to 70 pounds, so this thing ain't going to go anywhere when it's sitting on the hull. And the second thing is that with the brass collar ring that is on the upper hull, that also does a significant job in keeping the turret nice and centered and rolling when it comes time for that of the rotation. In addition to keeping the turret rotate smoothly, it also keeps itself aligned. So this is one of those systems that fell by the wayside. Also, it became kind of a nuisance when it comes time to remove the turret, you have to constantly go inside and remove this little knob in order to fully remove the turret from the hull. The system itself was dropped with the later generations of Armor Tech kits and it's only found again on these two generations, which if anyone is looking for an Armor Tech tank and encounter one in the secondhand market, you instantly know which generation is if also it has this bracket here as it's one of those giveaways. Another problem with the bracket is that due to the interior layout, you have to devote a large amount of space in the internals to have the clearance for this large bracket. As, as you can see, not only does it require significant depth to be nice and clear, but also rotation-wise as well. With all the electronics and features that's built into the tank, there's just not enough room to have all those components in their current locations as well as this large bracket. So the bracket is not going to be used as, the, like I said before, it's really not necessary on these builds. Now, if anyone is wondering why these systems are no longer in production, the, like I said before, the systems do have a few little quirks to them. One of which is the fact that it does make a big mess of the inside portion of the model, which I discussed earlier. And a second is that of reliability. These systems here were not known for their reliability and even people who have have these units and keep them firing, they do report several instances of a misfire or a light primer strike on their uh, on one or two of the rounds inside the cylinder. In addition to the other issues that I mentioned, these systems here also do not have any recoil whatsoever. They are purely just blast and sound effects. In addition to that, like I said before, another big problem is has to do again with the cleaning. Cleaning these systems requires you to actually swab the barrel and the breech with that of basically gun solvent, something like Ballistol or even Hoppy's number no. 9. And on something like a shotgun or a pistol or a rifle, it's not a problem. However, when you're dealing with a fully built, fully detailed and painted and weathered model like this one here, getting those very harsh solvents on the, these materials is definitely not something that's going to be beneficial and will really hurt the look of the model after prolonged use. Furthermore, the actual rounds which are used to chamber this system are not very common here in the United States which is very ironic because you know we have access to all sorts of ammunition, but these rounds here are not one of them. I tried making some snap caps on some spent shotgun shells with reloading them with new shotgun primers that I got from a local gun store. Unfortunately, when I did load the shotgun shells with the new primers and fitted them to the chamber, I was unable to successfully trigger a single one of the primers. I was getting light primer strikes in every one of them. From what I've seen from fiddling with the spring pressure as well as the striker pressure, more than likely this has to do with the type of primers, as I have a hunch that the actual primers used on the on the real blank rounds that this thing is chambered for are actually a lot lighter compared to the ones that I was using from the gun shop. You can see with all of these issues and problems swirling in the mix, you could see why these units here weren't very popular and Armor Tech themselves not only stop production of these units, but also the ability for the tanks to even have these components mounted and be in spec with them. 
the last generation of Armor Tech tanks to feature the capability for use of this system here goes to about 2009 to I believe even 2011. After that generation, Armor Tech has scrapped the capability of their tanks to feature this system inside and all of their tanks now only have the feature for having the electronic flash and mechanical recoil systems that are seen on basically all the other contemporary model kits and RC tanks that are on the market today. Well, hopefully anybody who has an interest in armor tech tanks as well as in radio control tanks in general will find this content very interesting. Now, I do have a part two of this video, which I go into more detail in discussing the mantlet, the barrel, and the muzzle brake, as well as a few of the other fittings that have been added to this tank here. That video is going to follow very shortly, and once posted, I'll have a link of this found in the video description for part two. And with that, that wraps up part one of this project update video for this radio-controlled vintage Armortech Tiger 1. If you like this video, stay tuned for part two, and also don't forget to check out the EastCoastArmory.com Facebook page, where there are more photographs of this build that have been posted since the project start. And also don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.